Mark Levine and in Aragon, but no film of New York City. I started in documentary filmmaking many centuries ago. I found that on Tona Mars and then worked on one of the documentaries. But I have also been lucky enough to work in feature films, uh, in television series, uh, but I always come back to documentaries. Fana no film karaza na film afa ko ana film na seria lefa mtele ya fa fiera na tam film toki o ngara fona. And I ask myself why? What is it about documentaries that brings me back? Te vanta tena we ina fona na matunga na fiera na mono toki o ngara. I like to read you a quote from a famous documentary filmmaker named Albert Mazels. Mi citation à vous l'avez Albert Maisel ça c'est pour le documentaire ou avec comme na jour. He said as a documentarian I happily place my faith and faith in reality. Te son tenende am ma pour le documentaire na te fiana ko pe comme reza kan fa kin ar fa kin na zed en réalité. It is my caretaker the provider of subjects themes Experience. All endowed with the power of truth and the romance of discovery. To put that in my own words, in documentaries you capture what's happening. In fiction films, you stage what's happening. As exciting as making a feature film is with actors uh, and set designers and all sorts of people on the crew, if I want to film on a clay, they may come now actor, the equipa na pano a designer as the equipa af. Nothing compares to the excitement and thrill of capturing a moment that only happens once, and there is no take two. The savate pe na kun ani san savate pe fano fana film a documentary we is momo na clay a capture no savate me ti film tu ni savate le no in ti si a vaka ya film na jamante. Now. In the United States, we are living through a time that has been called the golden age of documentaries. And I think there are a few reasons for that which I want to discuss with you. First, reality TV. I don't know how many people here know what reality TV. So, reality TV has popularized using real people and real situations. But most reality TV is actually staged and scripted. It's not really Housewives of Atlanta is not really documentary. The Housewives of Atlanta is not a documentary. They may be real housewives, but the fights and the dramas are created by the producers. But you can see that the Housewives of Atlanta is not a documentary. So as documentarians, we sometimes joke, we want to put the real back into reality. Another reason for the growing popularity of documentaries is social media and new technology. With your mobile phone, you can now make your own documentary. So this technology has made it, so just like writing, anybody can write their own story, anybody can draw their own picture, Today, the technology allows anybody to make their own documentary. 
fa amzoru nam teknolojia ni la reja ava kamulon dokumentera antenan. And the final reason is this idea that there is so much information and data bombarding us. Tenia antu manala kakua de misa fa amat bombarde amna informasos doni pe de pe mitsik. That we actually need a way to make sense of all this new input. Sometimes we almost overdose on how much we're exposed to. Then the second major thing is overdose. Then to this information exposure, we see that the mila a bit of mila larger than. We need to make sense of it, and where once maybe newspapers would help and magazines would help, and even news programs. Today, in many ways, the documentaries are a way of helping us make sense of all the news and information that bombards us. Documentaire, te yoyan, fofo yoyan, ni télé ou autre émission, fan documentaire, t'es dans les salles manapétiques, et ma maison sans une information peut être pesée pour partir dans ma tête natique. So, if you have a question at any point, please raise your hand. Let's let's hear it because I want to get your input. Kami sfantani na nilalay na tunga de sangon at sangan tara na de tunga deng tene na sa chia bati kuwen si feovan em naro. Because even the form documentary is probably in all filmmaking now the most wide open. There are many different styles of documentary. Na amso a mis na ilet lewe documentary ang aso de falas sa form a mis si karaza marco pide ben karaza na documentary. I don't know if any of you have seen any of Michael Moore's documentaries. Uh, Michael Moore. Roger and me. Roger and me. Bowling for Columbine. Bowling for Columbine. Fahrenheit 9/11. Fahrenheit 9/11. I bring him up because he's one of the most successful uh, documentary filmmakers in the world. Today. But he also has his own style. He is a character in his documentary. And not only is he a character, he's a provocateur. He will go up to people and challenge them with a camera. So that's one style of documentary filmmaking. Another style is uh, a film, I don't know um, if you've ever heard of it. It's a film called Look of Silence. Look of Silence, and Titan. From Indonesia. Uh, by a filmmaker Joshua Oppenheimer. Joshua Oppenheimer, I know that. Who also made a film called Act of Killing. I know film and actor who is an active killing. Both of these films are about the massacres that occurred in Indonesia in 1965 and 1966. Who film and actor who is an 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 actor who is when the Cold War was raging between the United States and the Soviet Union. And the Americans backed a military regime in Indonesia which wiped out all the communist and sympathizers of the left. And what's amazing about these two films is this filmmaker found some of the people who led those death squads. And 50 years later, he had them act out on camera how they murdered thousands of people. So, in the act of killing, it's part documentary and part reenactment. Reenactment, where you act out. Ni de le documentaire zan e un mis un parti a list documentaire e un parti a jou joué mis le ou la joué rôle. And it was so powerful, the Indonesian government banned it from being shown in Indonesia. 
Tu es un homme qui gouvernement indonésie in the second film the look of silence oh, my look of silence the filmmaker follows a survivor who lost his brother in these massacres film le pano film ana naraka ola nakraya sei sufi voice sei pana muni ralana to ana to new massacre he's an ophthalmologist an eye doctor and some of the people that he is a doctor to are the people who killed and tortured his brother. This is a remarkable documentary because he starts talking to these people who he's fixing their eyes about why they killed his brother and many others. And if you want to find an example of a documentary that has impact, another style of documentary filmmaking is what the French call cinema verite. The quote I read you at the beginning but by Albert Maisels. He and his brother David are two of the most famous documentary filmmakers. The Maisels brothers is how they were known. The Maisels brothers. And their first major documentary in the United States was called Salesman. And it was Cinema Verite. Cinema Verite, ladies where they followed a Bible salesman in the United States for a year in his life. And then they put it together the way you would put a movie together in a theater like this, and they opened it in New York City in a movie theater. It was one of the first documentaries to ever be shown in a theater like a regular scripted movie. And in many ways, it was the beginning of what we call the independent film movement. Now, I was lucky enough as a teenager to work for the Maisels brothers as an apprentice. I will tell you a little story. I heard a rumor that at this time there were two major films, documentary films being edited in New York City. This is 1970. One was Woodstock, Woodstock, which Martin Scorsese, the famous film director, Martin was, Scorsese, the director and lead, he was editing that film. He's not the, montage the, film. the other film was a film about the Rolling Stones tour of the United States in 1969. As a crazy teenager, I'd actually gone to see the Rolling Stones in Madison Square Garden that December. So, I found out where the Maisel's office was, which was actually 1674 Broadway above the Ed Sullivan Theater where the Beatles first performed in the United States. And I walked into the office hoping maybe I could find something that they would let me do as a, as a young student. And somebody handed me five cans of film and told me go around the corner to the Duart Film Lab and bring these cans. And 
And I did, and for the next few days, I just ran errands until one day David Maisel stopped me. Lasam face face to phone, and I didn't answer his phone. I'm not going to answer the call. Sakan and David Maisel, sir. And he looked at me and he said, "Who the hell are you?" Then he said, "No, I'm not going to know." I explained that I was just a young student, but trying to get involved in filmmaking. And for the next six months, I worked as an apprentice on the film called Gimme Shelter. Now, Gimme Shelter is a classic documentary. Documentary classic like Gimme Shelter, because it quite literally captures on film the end of the 60s. So, do you think I'm capturing the vision? So, I'm talking about the end of the 60s. It also shows you how, in documentary filmmaking, the real events can change the whole direction of where you thought a film is leading you. Maps you go in a way. Maps you go see films. If the reality real, meet manovan. La la na tu kuni. La la na na novan. Na novan le film. The Maisels were hired by the Rolling Stones to make a 15-minute promotional film about them. Film promotional la moban Rolling Stone na 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 karaman Rolling Stone na misol sa tamsay o dumdum ka tap kaya minuto na lapan. And the Rolling Stones finished their 1969 tour with a free concert in California outside San Francisco. Ano kung sa katil tayo pa lang San Francisco ni Rolling Stone na tapang mil ni tour zero tapang mil losan sa tulong tourne. They wanted to put on their own Woodstock. Unfortunately, things went bad there, and a young African American kid was stabbed and killed while the Rolling Stones were performing on stage. When the Maisels got back. From the laboratory, the film of the concert, because they had about ten crews shooting it. Na na nakipa na kufuldo sa ni remisol sa film may alisa. Tere fala sa tiren le fiteo le tere chaso sa jom sa saro. They discovered that they had the murder on film. Tere itan sa jom fufu film ito kaya le fuma na monuna le akis. And to the Rolling Stones' credit, they decided let's build this short film we were going to do. Into a major feature movie. Then Anthony Lee Rolling Stones are written and Nick Rolling Stones are all at all. No one a film of Manu can admit in part he and Lee Missy Murtrain. That was a profound lesson for me as a young filmmaker to see how something real could change the direction of an entire film. This day one as the lesson I'm about to appear in a chapter no for no one a film and away Miss Savacham see on a crack here. May have a camera move and direction on the film. Not only that, the film itself was evidence. So, San Fuzul Pali de Lisa, the film in Mansa, Savacha, Virident and Nomlis. And many of the themes that came together in that film uh, culture, music, uh, race, violence uh, many of these have been part of my work ever since. Then, Santa Fita Tom Nyasa Kuni, the Tema Reda Tom, the film, or is a culture, or is a racism, or is a violence. In fact, I can think of another famous documentary, classic documentary. Have a come here, children. I'm looking for the classic and a great one. Called the Battle for Chile. The Battle for Chile, Luatin. The Battle for Chile was the story of the end of democracy in Chile and in South America in the early 70s. Tatara ni faran democracy tani Chile tani America tushu tatam ni tonafit pulzan. And it was made by political activists. Natona activista politik. And it starts with one of the most impactful scenes I've ever seen in a documentary. Timanum kam na sena zida ko falak ni sen pakta ita kundira tam na dokumentar. A cameraman is shooting a demonstration. Is cameraman na filme demonstration? And the police come to break up the demonstration. De tunga le police manja van le demonstration yo. The cameraman continues filming all of it. The bullet man who filmed it, the cameraman. And one of the military men aims his gun at the camera. 
Tidak nak kaya ambil polis ya, mau lama nak pasal lek ada ulap tu memfilm mereka mengkamera. And he shoots the cameraman. Tidak filem le kameraman. You see the camera fall. Tidak kita nak ambil kamera menzir. And tragically, the cameraman die. Tidak kita tidak mat ku le kameraman. That's how that film opens. It's something I will never forget seeing. Kau cakap saya faham buat le film tu ada ikut mana saya mesti nai tak kau nai tak kau saya. It was a film that had to be smuggled out of Chile to be shown in the rest of the world, but could not be shown in Pinochet's Chile. So those are, I'm, I'm just giving you some examples of, there are many ways that a film can have impact. Another very, very famous uh, documentary in America is one called Thin Blue Line. Mr. Thin Blue Line, that is a documentary about Laza in America, and who? By the filmmaker Earl Morris. And on Earl Morris, one of film and actor. That's the story of a man who was sentenced to death. That are na ulla de la na crazy fucker, say na sti tu fucker jaman de pafat. For a murder he did not commit. And here, the filmmaker, who before he became a filmmaker, was actually a private investigator. Made a documentary proving that the man in prison couldn't have committed the murder. And in that case, that man was freed from prison because of that documentary. Now, obviously, there are many, many different kinds of subject matter and areas of interest that documentaries explore. I mentioned Two films, The Battle of Chile and Fahrenheit 9/11. Then film on a crew at the off, Battle of Chile, the Fahrenheit 11. I want to mention another film that just came out. The then film on a crew is a film that I don't know. Which I saw only six months ago. The Bolaita Ku is a Bolaita Ku in Bolan Alasa Zay. Which is another film about global politics. This one is called The Last Men in Aleppo. The Last Men in Aleppo. Did you translate it? There have been probably six or seven documentaries already made about the tragedy in Syria right now, the Syrian civil war. What so moved me about this documentary is you get to know a small group of citizens from the city of Aleppo. 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 It was a city that resisted the government and the dictator Assad. And when you see images of the city, you can't even believe people live there. But there are still thousands of people living there, and the film focuses on a small group that is like the Red Cross. And whenever there's a bombing or an attack by the Syrian government, the Red Cross goes to try to rescue people and dig them out of the rubble and save them. The For me, what is remarkable and so impactful about this documentary is one moment you are seeing these tragedies. And these men trying to save people. And the next moment they're taking a shower and they're going to the wedding of one of their good friends. The juxtaposition of what we would think of as the normal moments in our lives and some happy moments. With the barbarism of these attacks and this violence, it 
touches you in a way that none of the other films I've seen about Syria have. Ma pietz puana mit sa yet tit 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 sa yona tele film afa uba Siri. Because it makes you feel like these are your neighbors. These are your friends. Fa matunga no matsap sa ne ulla panul putri jinam noro ulero nama noro. They're not foreigners. They're not somebody else. Tu fa yin sa ro tu ul kaf sa ro. They're like the people you grew up with. Fa ochan ulla ni agam tup tam noyan. And that's an important point about documentaries versus journalism. The point important on the need documentary and our need journalism say. If you came to me with an idea, I'd say, let me see a little of what we what we call a sizzle reel. The what we call sizzle. It's like heat. The ah 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 say okay. Like like a trailer or a teaser. What you need teaser? A taste. Let me. As I want to see you get this. Let's say you wanted to make a film about somebody here. What you know that they are not filming, but you are not creating. So I say, show me two minutes of what the person looks like. The usual way, our man, the usual way, not the most normal, the usual way. It's a it's it's a casting reel. Mano, the casting that kill. Um. So that's and and. Uh, talk a little about on that casting reel what the story is about. And that can mean you'd also show the location. And maybe a little of what we would call a scene. Um, and what I mean by a scene is this is a scene. I'm Talking to all of you, but it's not just an interview; it's a scene. Somebody's a camera roll center. If you put some TV sen. So that's number one. Show me a little of what this world looks like, what the characters look like. Selu folone amane u samajakil mo maneu chuchuna one ze sen ze u chuchuna one le personage. To give me a short treatment, uh, two three pages. Faru manugata u chan resume kiel na dua tro page. Of what your ideas. Mo banyev cho. How you see it. Developing and why you want to make. What you know, one of them of it, and I want to see if I'm not in that you know what those are. Third, okay, a budget. Fatelo budget. You're right. You don't know sometimes how long a story will take to unfold. Mar na fatu fatu chonye jewe manja ba afrina na fata na tata na kray. But you have to make an educated guess of how much time you will need to explore and tell this story. Fatu mensi mi zake no. Imagine me to open the fridge and after night that after night that are anti that arti. And that means in both shooting it, and the montage, and editing it, the montage. And the montage in documentary filmmaking is often where the film is really created. And the film le montage on create no four na le film ma tetik. And a rough schedule. The ma meja kasmar ma meja kajan da kile no kajan da bruta zan. Now obviously, as you mentioned. You can't always know, but you have to try to project. To fata jo mi so mi za kama no projection kiel. And the more you do it, the more you get a sense of what it might. Kada karek na no vano anazen na fata ra noe ocho chson me tu faritan. Then you have something to knock on the door. Te yoku ano bila mando do mara faran. To approach other producers, studios, networks, rizo. Corporations, entreprises that may have an interest in the subject matter, the story. You want to look for those allies. Finally, look. There are times that you decide you're just going to set out on your own. Or with. Two or three colleagues, allies, who are willing to join with you. And there have been many great documentaries, a few of which we've discussed today. These documentaries are a bit unsatisfied with the ten seconds on Jena. That were made because people were committed and were willing to do whatever it took to get the story out. But ideally, you can find some financing, and in today's world, the, the the good news is there are more distributors 
of non-scripted films today than has ever existed in the world before. Den nidal molo tat finos modes a ocha mafuna taku amzoma num kapeza kenu la malina mche muwa muwa redi filmo toki montera ren. And what I mean in the United States, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. Dan itas unizo misa Netflix a Hulu Amazon. Verizon. Verizon. These are all new players, and they're all hungry for non-fiction documentary films and documentary series. Sa reu la vo vo nat nusia jo ra nisa dom tad film documentera non-fiction pete pe mit sa reu amzo. So what what that means is there's a larger marketplace. Sa ne me psuka ta me psuka ta zan zen zen ti kula zen. Finally, you're right that. Scripted movies, especially big commercial movies. Marna tene nawe le le filma mi scripta ren jo jira le filmo commercial. Are much more profitable and much better paying to work on. Aza una full a kuku, aza una aza una mura mura aza una full. Even with all the recent popularity of documentaries, you're still not going to make the same amount of money if you make a documentary as if you made a Hollywood movie. For all the people who are not the film or the movie, they are not the same as the movie. 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 You get paid the most if you're a director. If you're a cameraman, if you're an editor, that you actually get paid more than on a Hollywood film. So there's no doubt documentaries are still the poor cousin. And that's why some of my friends say you must be crazy still making documentaries. But I'm sure, as many of you know, there is more to life than money. And doing something you believe in and that has meaning uh, has value in itself. Now that I've given you such a long answer to your first question, I've probably forgotten your second, third, and fourth question. Uh, as far as insurance goes, uh, you, you know, when you make a film like Class Divide or for uh, a network like HBO, you have to have insurance. That's that's a requirement when you're making a a major production for a network for a studio. You have to have production insurance. You have to have liability insurance, and you have to have finally what's called errors and omission insurance, which means if somebody comes and sues you for the film you've made, you have insurance. The raorifa mano filma wana production lepe na wana studio lepe da mila manakera zana insurance. Your last question about when the camera is rolling is a great one. When I got caught with Daphne, my producing partner, in that drive-by, uh, when we were shooting Gang War. After I crawled back up to see what had happened, I said, did you get that? And of course she was shaken like I was and she said, I don't think so. I was devastated. It wasn't until we went back to the hotel room and actually put the tape in that she actually had the camera was still rolling. She didn't even know it. And she had captured it. But there's a indie film that was made literally 30 years ago in the early 80s. It's a very funny film called Living in Oblivion. 
And it's about the trials of making an independent film with no money. And it, what's so funny about it is everything the director wanted to capture after all the rehearsals and all the craziness to get things set up every time the magic moment happened they miss it the camera breaks down somebody gets sick it's a classic because it goes to the point that you can never know um, even in Gimme Shelter the Maisels had no idea whether they had the murder on film it wasn't until they were in a screening room like this looking at the dailies that they saw there it is so that is part of the paradox you live with when you are in this world you can't have the camera on 24 7 and yet you are always afraid the moment you turn it off that's when the magic will happen I hope that answers your question I can talk? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Thierry. Uh, thanks a lot for, for sharing. Uh, my first question is like, is there a borderline between documentary film and film made by journalists? Because recently I saw the one made by the CNN journalist about this slave slave stuff in Libya. And, and that, that's why I came up with this question. As you mentioned earlier, there is a difference between these two. Okay, and my second question is like, what makes it different uh, a documentary film between like these scripted movies, I'm talking about like terms of preparation, like pre-production process and all of this stuff. And my last question is, as we are talking about impact documentary today, uh, and you talked about the jail in New York earlier, like how are you choosing like how am I going to impact the audience for a certain topic? Because they, the company or the people who hired you, they choose you because they trust in you and instead of like, yeah, we can just write a book about it or just put it on the news and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so journalism and documentary filmmaking are definitely related. And both overlap. In, a, in the United States, starting in the 60s, there was a movement called New Journalism. Meaning, not just reporting the facts, but the reporter themselves becoming part of the story. That was a, a movement of journalism in the direction of documentary filmmaking, in that it was saying you can have a point of view. At the same time, Documentary filmmaking, many documentary in, in many documentaries have been made by famous journalists. 
I first won an Emmy Award in the United States on a documentary done by probably one of the most famous television journalists in our country named Bill Moyers. Mr. Bill Moyers is then a panel of the film documentary that I It was a documentary called The Secret Government. The Secret Government and another And it was about the Iran-Contra scandal that had happened during the Reagan administration. That was journalistic in the sense that it gave a history of America's involvement in the coups and foreign involved in affairs of many countries over the 20th century. At the same time, it was a documentary in the sense that it also had a point of view. Because it ended with the journalist Bill Moyers taking the Constitution of the United States and putting it in a shredding machine. In a conventional journalistic report, you would not do that. So there is tremendous overlap. I'm now working on a film with a CNN uh, journalist, son. Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Sanjay Gupta. And at the same time, one of the things that we are trying to do is not make it just a CNN report. We want to make it a non-fiction movie, a documentary feature. And this goes to your second question. Probably the one area that is very much like a feature filmmaking is casting. As I told you in the Rikers film, uh, my associates and I interviewed over a hundred people. And out of that, ten were chosen. That is very much like what we do when we do a scripted movie and we're looking for all the key roles. And traditionally, we would be sitting there and people would come in and sit here and read lines, but now almost all casting is done on video. So that, in fact, many actors just video themselves reading the lines and then send it into the production. So basically you're sitting in an editing room or looking at a computer or even your mobile phone and whether they're the real people or actors you are trying to decide who are the best to tell your story. Now, what about hiring a director of photography? In a feature film, obviously, you will look at their work, as you would in a documentary film. You will look at their work, but you might be looking for different things. And, and I will tell you what I personally look for. I think the biggest difference between a cinematographer in a conventional fiction feature film and a documentary film is a scripted feature the director and the cinematographer plot out the move of the camera and the actors you block in a documentary you want somebody who can capture as this man said, the moments 
that might not happen again. Hamba dokumentera isa nora kelete nanti wala nak kerja isa nora kapcuri bobo nak kerja meti fir natun. You also want someone that can cover a scene. Hino kumeti tajula fakamu no cover juga na sena nak kerja. Now, in our profession, you will hear phrase over and over again, both in documentary and features. It's phrase nak kerja in phone on atau phone over na film mana phone over na film dokumenter. The phrase is coverage. Tewe kule lete no cover juga. Did you get the coverage? As no ben cover juga, cover ben no ben listo. Okay, so what is the coverage? The conventional coverage is a wide shot of this scene. And you have to decide where you take that wide shot. Is it from back there? Is it from behind us? Both in a feature and in a documentary. The medium shots to see who's in this audience and the close-ups close and the close-ups are not just me talking and you translating but it's also the people on their phones the people taking notes the people sleeping it's all the little details that are also happening while the scene is playing okay now in the documentary world I would add the one more critical thing and this is really where you see the skill of a documentary cinematographer. And what that is, we call it massage the scene. Massage the scene You have a lens on your camera. When you are wide, it's 25 millimeter, 30 millimeter. Mid 25 millimeter, 30 millimeter. When you are tight, it might be 70 millimeter, 80 millimeter. Je vois quelque chose de 70 à 80 millimeter. The sweet spot for many close-ups and portraits is around 50 millimeter. Et on me sent 50 millimeter, on y a une différence entre les deux close-up. So what I'm saying is, you want to find a camera person who's covered the scene conventionally. And then can take the camera and start here while you're talking. And then slowly move to this face right over here. And then slowly move to this gentleman sleeping here. All this without any edits at all. It's mis montage, mis on atanzania. While I am still rambling on. Mandida fatara fente no kyo. That's the magic of a great documentary cinematographer. Sente na mashiam na we te na zavara tsara na pano filmo dokumenter. Is they tell you the whole story moving through it as an eyeball would. Sad mande o tunen masundur la mitsa le ula mande dem tsere le manuva le tata. With no edit at all. And, that, and I have a scene from that first movie I worked on as a teenager, Gimme Shelter. That Albert Basil shot of the Rolling Stones in the recording studio listening to Wild Horses. And I show it to every young cameraman. Because it starts on Mick Jagger listening, and it slowly goes down to his hand, and then it moves over to Keith Richards, who is like this, nodding out. You're not even sure he's conscious. And it slowly moves down to his body to you see these snake skin boots tapping to the music. Again, all in rhythm to the music, to what's happening in the scene. And no cut. That's the magic cinema verite camera person. So, to 
To answer your question, yes, there is preparation in both scripted features and non-scripted documentaries. But sometimes you're looking for different things. And location is another one. Trying to decide where you want to shoot these things. Your final question was... I forgot. Uh, it's about how are we going to impact like uh, oh. for a certain topic. Right, 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 right. That, uh, uh, you know, how to make a movie that you know will have impact. Look, I, I'm going to give you an example of, of, of where I was wrong. I was in a small screening room just like this with Vice President Al Gore and some of the people who put money up for Inconvenient Truth. And I left that screening thinking, oh, that's you know certainly a very educational film important film, but no one will go see it. It's preaching to the already converted, who are already aware of climate change. I don't know that it will be able to reach new people and make them aware. To my surprise, it became one of the most successful documentaries in history. So sometimes it's not even the film, it's the moment the film comes out. Is it the right moment? Do you hit it? at the moment where there's a wave. Uh, like right now in the United States, obviously there's a movement about gun violence. There's a, so there's a movement about sexual violence. And, and these things are, are, are hard to predict, but... The, kind of coming full circle, the if the film has an emotional hook, a character that you relate to, that you feel, that you empathize with, as I described in the film Last Men in Aleppo, that stayed with me because of the emotional impact. It wasn't the journalism or the history of Syria or understanding all the sides. It was seeing people that I could relate to who I felt were just like my friends and family. And I felt I really got to know and like that made all the difference. So I would say one area is looking for the emotional connection to an audience. I am uh, Isu, and uh, I'm also a videographer and passionate. So my question is, um, when we make a documentary film, should we write a script? And uh, if so, uh, if so, what happen? What will happen if um, the situation doesn't match the script, or um, when things doesn't go as planned? Thank you. Um. I'm glad you asked that question because I ask it every day. Uh, 
Tara fa na pirogo zay fanta nizay zay tia pit mambe chaka zay fanta nizay isanandro. The reason is, I think it is important to write down what you're trying to do because it helps you organize your thinking. It disciplines you and it gives you certain goals that you set to achieve. So I think it's important to write what we would call a treatment. It helps you focus. My frustration with many executives in my business is they expect the documentary to match what you wrote in the beginning. And as I've described to you on some of these films, hopefully there are going to be a few things that happen that you could never imagine. Possibly they'll be, be, uh, they'll be better than anything you would have even written. You've heard many people say, you know, reality now is crazier than any fiction anyone could dream up. So, the ideal is that you can show somebody what your goal is, your mission is, your idea, your story. But they give you the freedom and they understand that on that journey you may change direction. And they support you in that. And I'm going to give you a final example. The movie, the documentary film that just a few months ago won the Academy Award. Le film documentaire en Grèce est nazo prix en Académie vous voyez non? It's called Icarus. Tu veux Icarus ne naran? Titran. It started as a documentary by a cyclist, a competitive cyclist who wanted to show that he could beat the drug testing scheme in his sport. So he was going to take some of these illegal drugs to enhance his performance, but he was going to show you how you could beat the tests that try to discover that. As he was making this film, he hired a Russian doctor, scientist, who had been involved with all the Russian Olympic athletes. He hired him to consult on how to beat the tests. And that seemed like a kind of wild idea, but this Russian uh, is a real character and loved being on camera and kind of went along with it. And then one day something amazing happened that he never could have put in his treatment. All over, the, all over the world, the news broke that the Olympic Committee was investigating all the Russian athletes for illegal doping. And the man responsible for it was the man he hired to consult on his movie. So what started about a movie of I'm a cyclist, I'm going to show you how to beat the system, all of a sudden turned into a movie about this Russian who now was wanted all over the world by the Kremlin, the International Olympic Committee, everyone, and he went in hiding. For Luan Lua, they say, I will cast your name as Manukan, I'm a resident of the drug, a resident of the past, Zalis, 
ne va voir un tuyau de nissan de investigation dans le russe russe n'arrêtera de jouer c'est une autre page à cette étape du comité olympique à manière à tendre de riche and yet as crazy as it sounds he continued to let this filmmaker film him even in hiding as all this was happening So there is your classic example, first time filmmaker. Starts a film going in this direction. Happens to stumble on a character who all of a sudden turns the film way over in this direction. And ends up winning the Academy Award. So when an executive says to you, "Well, you wrote this six months ago, and now you want to do that," you just remind them of the Icarus story. Well, let me give you a mantra um, that I am. Repeated through my career. And I think it goes back also to this gentleman's question. Follow the footage. Let the footage tell you where to go next. Now, why do I say that? I've told you that I started as a kid on this film, Give Me Shelter, where the filmmakers themselves didn't even know they had the murder footage. They followed that footage, created a movie around it, a masterpiece that is a classic. You've often heard, I'm sure, stories of novelists and writers who say when they get so deep in their work that the characters in their work, the work itself starts leading them. They're following the characters they create. I never fully understood that until I spent time in the editing room. And what sometimes happens in the editing room is you think you have character A that is the main character that you've written in your treatment and you've submitted. And then character A introduces you to B and C And one night you're alone in the editing room. And why do I say one night? Because I call it the 12 midnight test. And what I mean is you're tired. You've been looking at footage all day. And all of a sudden your eyes open wide. You can't take your eyes off the screen. Something is happening that you didn't anticipate. A character is popping off the screen and speaking to you and saying, you thought A was the star. Hello, I just woke you up. You are You are now looking at the person that is going to lead this story forward. So, you ask about interviews. Look, this goes back to your question also. It's funny. You want to pre-interview people. So you have some idea what you want to cover, what you want to talk about, how much they're willing to share with you. At the same time, sometimes you're pre-interviewing somebody and it's so fresh and it's so real what they reveal. Then when you shoot it three weeks later and you ask them the same question, Et 
it seems a little rehearsed and stale. And you're saying, why didn't I have the camera running when I did the pre-interview? So, the film that I've been showing here, Class Divide, the main character in the film is a nine-year-old little girl, Rosa. I was doing a casting interview with her. I had never met her before. But we shot it in a way that it could be used. And instead of a five-minute Five to ten minute casting interview. It, it turned into a two hour interview. Or should I say a two hour monologue? Which became the spine for Class Divide. So it's there are no rules. The other, the final thing is, as a, as a filmmaker, especially a documentary filmmaker, you need to think not only in terms of interviews, you need to think in scenes. What do these characters do? Do they work on a farm? Do they work in a factory? Do they work in an office? Do they have a family? You need to think of the documentary, going back to your question, sir, as if it was a scripted movie. That's why some people call documentaries non-fiction movies. So, I don't know if that answered your question on interview. But often, an interview can be used also as a voiceover. Where you use the audio for the interview. But you're showing the images of somebody's life and activity. And that can be very effective. Thank you. I have uh, just one question. Have you already regretted doing the documentary, or are you or, are you proud of of uh, all your documentary? Um, did, did you say have I regretted making any of my documentaries? No. I I, I mean I think some are probably better than others. Uh, <laughs> But I have to be honest, at this point, I, I see them all as a, a process kind of of a larger body of work. And quite frankly, you know, to sum up, I mean, even being here in Madagascar, this is all new to me. I didn't know anything about Madagascar. And what is so constantly exciting about this kind of filmmaking is that you are always learning, meeting new people, and having new experiences. And that's when you feel most alive. So again, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to again finally say you do have stories to tell. And I look forward someday to seeing on the screen, whether it's on a television, a big movie screen, or even on my mobile phone, some of the stories that you will make. Merci beaucoup.